Welcome to the Extra Podcast. This is episode number 286. My name's Greg. I will be hosting the episode today. Joining me around the table. I'm here, Greg. Andy Steiger. Andy Steiger. The and great. The legend. The and legend, Andy. The I'm myth. thinking about that for a book, actually. What? The legend? The legend. <laughs> <laughs> called Lessons in Humility by Andy Steiger. <laughs> <Totally>. An autobiography. <laughs> An autobiography. That's my next book, guys. There can, you go. Can I write the foreword? Not a chance. Uh, <laughs> Why? <laughs> oh, I don't trust Greg. That would be so much fun for me to write that foreword. Let oh. me tell you something about Andy. I only have 87 words yeah, to this do book's this. book's garbage. <laughs> I haven't read it, and I won't. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord! Uh, also joining me today is Pastor Ezra. Yeah, Okoti. it's good to be back. Good to be back in the saddle. Um, so good to be with you, Ezzy. Yeah, Jeffrey's out. Jeff is out at a meeting with uh, Steve Weens and Matt Glezos, who has been announced this past week as the campus pastor. Yeah, of where? At uh, our Port Coquitlam church plant called Tri-City Church, mm-hmm. and that's a partnership with uh, Westside Church in Vancouver and Crossridge Church in Cloverdale, and so things are starting to get geared up there. We're Actually, excited for that. When's that going to launch, Gregory? I think the plan is September 2017, Yes. Uh, and if you're listening to this and you have an interest in, in finding out more about that work that's happening in the Tri-Cities area, you can uh, go to tricitychurch.ca. And right. uh, see their website there. There's a few pieces of information there. Plus, on January 29th in the evening, there's going to be a information meeting for anyone who's interested in more about the Tri-City there's Church a lot plant. Of, there's a lot of uh, informa- ways in which you can get information about yep. it. You can check our website, northfree.org. You can also go to Facebook and just search Tri-City Church. And I think they're there as well. And so there's a lot of information there. And Matt was also saying that if there's anyone you know out there or anyone who's interested in this church plant and wants to receive emails regular, regularly regarding what's going on, uh, Matt would be more than happy to have your email contact on mm-hmm. his list. He'll add you there and uh, you'll be receiving feedback, updates, and all the rest of it yeah. as the days unfold. And feel free to send in to the extra podcast any questions that you have about it. Yeah, we'll we hope to get our... Matt on an episode here. Yeah, that'd be great. Soon, yeah. uh, so you guys can can meet him and in and extra podcast and land and hmm. hear from him. So, if you have any questions about Tri City Church, you can email Matt Glezos. Uh, his email address is Matt M A T T at tricitychurch.ca. He would love to hear from you hmm. and talk more with you about that work. He would. So that's where Jeff went. So that's where Jeff is. That's For why a moment, he's not I thought here. that uh, he had just abandoned and he had gone to lunch without me. I was you a know. little bit depressed. Yeah. No, Ezra, you, Ezra needs a lot of careful handling. Yeah. Like he... He's sensitive. He's a sensitive soul. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Ezra, in your sensitivity, mm. I, I've noticed that you've expanded your your interests in, in other things. This is not even a segue. Mm. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about that game you watched yesterday. That oh, you were just... yes, 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 yes. So coming coming to Canada from from Kenya. Via... You're from Kenya? Yeah, I know. It's shocking, right? I haven't heard that yet. Yeah, there you go. So coming from Kenya through Scotland and then to Canada, I was a yeah, big... That was interesting, by the way. Yeah. Can I just pause there for a moment? I'm doing Pausing. my PhD in Aberdeen. Yes. At Aberdeen University. And you, of all places, yes. you went from Kenya first to Aberdeen. To Aberdeen. In that's Scotland. Right. And that's yes. where you did ministry for, what was it, two years? No, for a year. A year. Yes. And actually, when you get to Aberdeen, you have to talk to me about a place called Tilidrone. Any person who comes from Aberdeen and and learns that I was actually doing ministry in Tilidrone, they get stunned, like shocked, like, oh dear. You went there? Tilidron is a very, very, very rough area. It's like almost Compton mm. of Scotland. Of Scotland. Yes. It's a very rough area. So they'll rough some, sh- they'll rough some sheep up there. Oh, man. The, the, that place was Their it was kilt's getting a, in, a, in a knot up there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to touch that one. <laughs> I'm leaving that one alone. Yeah, but it was a very they it was play, an they interesting play the time. Bagpipes <laughs> yes. yes, it was an interesting it's time. Terrible. It was an interesting <laughs> time. So you and I should talk about Aberdeen. Okay. Yes, I have some nice little stories for you there. Mm. All right, back to what you were saying though. Yeah. So anyway, so I come to Canada and I was watching. I watched a lot of soccer. Played a lot of soccer. 
and um, wondered why people would watch football. Like football seemed so boring. Like you just play like one quick play takes like 30 seconds, 40 seconds. It's, it stops and then we all walk out. Another whole team comes in. You play mm. for a bit. You walk out. Like stop, go, stop, go. And a lot of commercials. Anyway, Steve Weens brought me into loving football. Oh my. So yesterday... That would be Monday. I watched the final of the college football season. Mm. And that was Clemson versus Alabama. Oh, my goodness. What a game. Mm. It boiled down to the last play, a touchdown by Clemson. Oh, it was it was quite the game. Apparently, the QB was or is 18 years old. The QB of Alabama. Now, Alabama is known to be like the... The school f- mm-hmm. that provide uh, that um, has the best teams, football teams, in the U.S. So they were the defending champions. They won. They beat Clemson last year, and so this year it was like a rematch, a, a rematch yeah. of these two teams. Oh, it was it was a great game. Yeah. Now, I got to say, I'm not, well spent. I'm not a huge fan of watching sports, but when it comes to college sports, particularly football and basketball. That's some that's some good watching right there. Oh yes, you can see did, them battling for it. You went to an NCAA March Madness game. Didn't I you? did, I did, and in fact, I would love to go to another one. I hope it. That one was in Portland. Uh, my wife and I had a great time. They do two games back to back, and I mean it was just fantastic. So, in other words, when you pay for your tickets, you get to you get two games. Oh wow, yeah. That's, that would have been that's fun. pretty good. Yeah, that's, that's that's a good deal. That's worth it. By the way, Greg, are you still uh, like? Uh, no, I don't want to talk about it. Oh, <laughs> we wouldn't go there. I don't want to talk about it. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. We'll <laughs> we'll, 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 on. <laughs> we'll leave that alone. Let's talk about something else for a while. <laughs> hey, uh, like, I'm going to use this moment to do some shameless promoting. No, I, I appreciate you <laughs> deflecting. Uh, March 3 4 is the Apologetics Canada Conference. Uh, we'd love to have you out. You can purchase your tickets. We have, well, honestly, I think, I say this every year, but I believe it. This is one of the best lineups we've ever had. Uh, Frank Turek is uh, setting it, things off on the Friday. We have uh, Christopher uh, Ewan uh, is going to be talking on homosexuality uh, on the Saturday morning. We've got uh, a number of TED Talks on the area of dehumanization from abortion, pornography, and doctor-assisted death. Mm. Alicia Wood's going to be talking about social justice. Uh, and then we have the best lineup of breakout sessions that we've we've ever had on a whole host of topics. We even have a Syrian refugee that's going to be there talking about what's going on in Syria and what you can do here in Canada uh, about that situation. It's going to be fantastic. What's the dates for this? Mar- March 3rd, 4th. Uh, that's a Friday, Saturday. And also, we want to shout out to all of you nurses, doctors, uh, teachers, uh, pastors, and if you know of anybody in that field, uh, Christopher Ewan, uh, or no, sorry, Christopher, no, Ewan McGallagher. That's that's the name. Uh, he is a doctor from Toronto. I think he's at Mount Sinai. He also has his PhD in long-term ventilation care. He's been published in the Washington Post, and he is going to be talking on the Friday afternoon. We're doing a free lunch here at Northview for, again, nurses, doctors, teachers, leaders. Uh, you can sign up for that. You actually need to email Cecilia here at Northview to, to reserve your spot. And, uh, and he's going to be giving a talk on Dr. Assisted Death, how to understand what's going on here in Canada and how we can respond to that in, from a Christian worldview. So mm. could we say then, I mean, people can email Cecilia and if you don't know how to get to Cecilia, just phone the church yeah. and, um, and the, the receptionist will help you out and give you all the information you need regarding how you can register for that. Is that fair? That's fair. And you will save yourself a spot. I'm sure that's going to go fast. Again, that's a free lunch, so make sure you do that right away. So they are limited. Space is limited. Space is limited. In fact, the conference tickets have been going faster than they've ever gone before as well. So make sure you buy those uh, soon and reserve yourself a spot. So how much is a conference ticket? Uh, That's a great question. Apologetics.ca? ApologeticsCanada.ca? Yeah, ApologeticsCanada.ca. You'll see, or, or to Apologetics Canada, conference.ca. Either one will take you there. Uh, I, I can't remember what the price is, but I do know that if you buy a couple's ticket, it's a little bit cheaper. Uh, there's adult and uh, student rates there. And also, if you know somebody that'd like to get a group rate, you can just contact Nancy mm. at nancy at apologeticscanada.com uh, and 
they can hook you up with a group rate. That'd be good. Andy, you're wearing a toque inside. Bro, I live in a constant state of coldness. Do you? Yeah, it's a bald man's curse. That's too bad. It's, I mean, look at Ezzy. He's wearing he's wearing a sweatshirt. A sweatshirt. What do you call it? a sweater? Hoodie. Hoodie? Yeah. A Cabela's hoodie. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Merry Christmas to me. Thank you. You like it? I do like it's it. Very nice. That's right. It's red. It looks good. Yeah, it looks good. I make everything look good. But no, really. honestly, Ezzy, let's just, like, when you shave your head, mm. the world becomes a colder place. This is true. This is true. Greg, I want Ezra to grow his hair out. You know, I would I've, like that. I've, I've always, I've always been wondering, or oh, being tempted to to grow my hair out and do some little dreadlocks. Oh, can you please but, do this? But, but he's a problem. If though. you would like Ezra to grow dreadlocks, please email. <laughs> this is not gonna e. go. Okoti. No way. At least grow the beard, man. Can hey, we get some beard? Oh, oh no, yeah. No, 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 no. It's it's now. I'm, now I'm getting old. It'll all be whitish. Yeah. I look like Gandalf. Dude, like that Gandalf. Would... <laughs> that'll not, that'll be scary. If you would like Ezra to grow kids. a beard, please email. <laughs> e. but <laughs> I'd love to see some beard on that. Oh, uh, yes. On that face here. That'd be fantastic. Yes. One like, uh, what's his name? Um, what is it? Graham Nichol. You know? Oh, yeah. He looks like North Sea Community Church. Yeah, he looks like Grizzly Adams. Doesn't oh, he? There yeah, you go. Fantastic. Yeah. I should grow one like that. I would like uh, that. No, it'll be too itchy. Sorry. It is itchy. All right, okay, we, we have on. some questions we want to uh, get through here uh, this morning. So if you have a question you want the Extra Podcast team to, to talk about, we have quite a few right now on the list, and we're trying to get through them, but uh, you're welcome to send them in to extra at northview.org. Here's the first one. Uh, this listener asks, just because we have been able to discern God as three persons of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is there anything in Christianity that necessitates... That God is only three and not four or five or, or more persons in one God. And some people think that this is a dangerous way of thinking. And do you agree? And if so, what what is the danger? I wasn't quite sure. Like, what do you think they're the danger of thinking that God is more than three? Is that what he's getting yeah, at? Yeah. So or she, it, I don't, I don't is, is it that. dangerous to believe that it is potential that the God who is there exists as more than three persons. And yet we have, even though we have not had that revealed to us, that that is actually true. Is that a dangerous idea? So let, let's kind of bat around the idea of, of the Trinity and, and the, the, the nature of God. And then we can, if we want to, we can talk about the danger part. So Okay, so I think the first place to start is for us as uh, believers, followers of Jesus Christ, uh, what we are to believe has been put together for us in the scriptures. So we have to start there. So anything outside, what we have to believe about God is already revealed to revealed us, to us yeah. in the scriptures. Everything we have to believe in God, uh, believe about God. Mm. So to to say that, hey, you know, would it be dangerous for us to believe something else about God that the scriptures do not reveal is very dangerous because now you've walked into a slippery slope. So you could believe now anything about God. If you were to say, yes, God probably is four persons or eight persons, so maybe they are committee now. Right. Or if you're Mormon, you're all gods. Yeah, you're all gods. So now, Mm -hmm. now where, where do you draw the line and say, okay, now this is outside this is not orthodox where do you draw the line well i think it's interesting that paul in galatians says listen i've given you the gospel you know you you have you have god's revealed word to you he says that if anybody comes hmm. now this is chapter 1 even an angel and preaches to you anything other than you than has been preached to you let that be a curse and he says it then was he do it twice or three times he says the same thing hmm. and to me this is this is so critical uh, this is one of the reasons why I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. I'm not following Charles Russell. It's one of the reasons I'm not a Mormon. I'm not following Joseph Smith. I'm not following Muhammad. You know, these are just men. I'm following Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, who has revealed God to us. Mm-hmm. And he's explained that God is three. Mm-hmm. Not four, not five, not two, not one. Three. Yes, in, in the scriptures, we do have an explicit revelation of who God is. He has chosen to now. Uh, would we say that the scriptures reveal everything we need to know about God exhaustively? No, 
but what God has chosen to reveal to us about himself has been recorded in scripture. And what we see is mm. Trinitarian language where you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who are all equal in terms of essence, yeah. and yet they are three persons. Yeah, three persons, one essence. This is yes. so critical. So it's one God. One God. Three persons. Yes. So the word Trinity is not actually in the New Testament. No. So why is it so necessary to be so committed to mm-hmm. the idea of God as Trinity? It's not a biblical word. Yes, but I think the biblical word pretty much defines what we see in the text, what we see the text revealing. So the text reveals that there is God the Father. Jesus refers to God as Father. Jesus also speaks about he will send another counselor who will come, who will reveal all his all, will reveal to us all, all truth, mm. uh, who will live and be with us. And then you have Jesus himself, whom when John the Baptist was baptizing Jesus, um, the Spirit of God ascended upon Christ as a dove. And then there was a voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son, believe in him. And not only that, John would say, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, and the word was what? God. God. So Mm. in other words, we see in the biblical texts Trinitarian uh, Trinitarian language. Mm -hmm. So the word Trinity is just a word that is coined to describe what we see in the text of Scripture about God. And you'll see that often with doctrine. We have lots of words that we use to describe doctrine that the Bible teaches. The word necessarily isn't in Mm. the Bible. But that doesn't mean that the concept isn't taught in the Bible. Yes. Now, one of the other things that you can do is... You can also go uh, the, the natural theology route, too. And you can ask yourself, well, what can we know about God? So we've been talking about what's been revealed to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, what can we know, though, through nature and through th- study, um, through, you know, philosophy? You know, mm-hmm. what, what can we know about God? And this is, I think, a really important aspect of Christianity that, that people some, I don't think give enough credit to. Because I used to be one of those Christians who thought, man, the Trinity is one of those unfortunate doctrines that we have. Mm-hmm. And, and, and really kind of you wanted to avoid it or kind of sweep it under the rug because we saw it as more of a nuisance. But now I realize, no, 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 the Trinity is one of the best doctrines that, that we have. And it's distinctly Christian. And mm-hmm. we're incredibly, I'm so thankful for it mm-hmm. because without it, you're in trouble. And this is, this is where like religions like Islam comes into into trouble where they are monotheistic and that they believe in one God, but it's not the triune God. And that so this now makes a distinction because some people will ask, well is Islam and Christianity the same thing? No. And and exactly right, no. no. Because we're not talking about the same God. No. And we're, we're talking about the triune God. Mm-hmm. And this is significant <clears throat> because it means in in the Bible we take this for granted. When the Bible says that God is love. You see, we'll just kind of pass over that. But but that is saying something distinct about God's nature. Mm. It's saying that love is an essential quality of his nature. This is something that Islam cannot say about Allah. And the reason is, is because Allah, if if God is, is one person, then uh, what, what does Allah love? Well, uh, Allah would have no concept of love until he creates yeah. something to love. Mm-hmm. And, and now what you're dealing with is an imperfect God, a God who has to create in order to complete himself. But we mm-hmm. don't, that's not what we're talking about in Christianity. We're talking about a God who is love within his very essence, and he does not need me to complete himself. Yes. This means then that within God, the Judeo-Christian God, we have a view of morality in that God lives in right relationship within himself. He is the very standard of right relationship. And within that, we can say that God is good yeah. and that God is love. And to that point, then we would say that uh, the Christian God, the God of the Bible, is complete in himself. So he does not need anything outside of himself to be complete within himself. Mm. Yeah, uh, um, Aquinas put it this way. He said, God is that which none greater can be conceived. 
this became the ontological argument. Mm-hmm. And it's greater to exist than to not exist. And so then before he concluded that God exists. And so th- that's what we're talking about is God is that which none greater can be conceived. And I'm saying that a triune God is greater than a non-triune God. Now, the question, though, that, that, that's being brought up, I think, is an interesting one. Mm-hmm. And that is, well, then is a four-person God better than a three-person God? Mm-hmm. And and now if we're still now again the, as as he said the Bible has revealed to us that God is yes. three, but I think that there is something interesting about this even from the natural theology perspective that we can say mm-hmm. that three persons is the completeness of relationship the 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 different forms of relationship that we encounter are encompassed within three, so there's no need for anything more than the three. I think this is unique, by the way, about family. So, for example, so you have the husband-wife relationship, and and that it, that is one form of relationship. But once that husband and wife has a child, they see that there is actually another type of relationship mm. that can be had. There can be the husband, the wife, and then their relationship with the child. Now, the questions that's being asked is, well, does that change if they have another child? And the answer to that is no. They could have four, five, six, but that's still the same triune relationship, husband, wife, children, or child. And so from that natural theological perspective, we could say that there's no need to add to God's being, that adding another person to this triune God doesn't meet God any greater, that he is fully, relationally fully encompassed Mm -hmm. within three persons. Yes. Mm -hmm. But the biggest, the biggest thing, and I'm sure like uh, Andy, you would agree with me and and Greg as well, the scriptures do not reveal to us Mm -hmm. a fourth member of the Godhead, mm. or a fifth, or a sixth, they don't. Therefore, for us then to begin to believe mm. that they could be the possibility, or, or even to entertain the notion that they could be a possibility of a fourth, fifth, sixth person of the Godhead would be ludicrous, because the scriptures do not say that. The moment we begin going down that road, then what you end up with is a cult at best, or heresy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it is. And, and the question was, is it dangerous? And the answer is, yes, yes. it's dangerous. Yes. Yeah. And this is something that uh, I think we have a harder time to appreciate because of where we are in space and time in the, the history of the church. But the idea of, of the, the debates about the Trinity and the debates about the, the, the two natures of Christ and all of these really mysterious um, truths that the scriptures teach throughout history, these, these mysterious truths have been tried to be resolved in a way that, that, um, removes the, the mystery. And in every way, every one of those approaches, the, the attempt to remove the mystery of these difficult doctrines has resulted in some kind of heresy yes. that the church said, no, nah, that's not right. That's right. Mm-hmm. And so, it, or to not be comfortable with the, the mystery. Right. Yes. You know, it, it's it has it's this tent it's this middle ground of tension. Yeah, for sure. That is it's key. I think for for all of us, it would be best for us to, even when we are approaching this conversation of the Trinity, approach it with the understanding or with the knowledge or the acceptance that you will not fully mm-hmm. grasp everything about this doctrine. So when you talk about a God, we have we worship one God mm-hmm. in three persons. Mm-hmm. So the word person, how do you define that word person? Because in this room right now, we are the three of us, Greg, Andy, and myself, and we are all persons. So the way we are persons, is that the same way God, the Father, Son, and Spirit are persons distinct from each other? Because Andy, there are things you like I don't like, Mm -hmm. and there are things I enjoy you don't either. So is that the way the Trinity is when you have, like, uh, does the Father have a different will from the Son, and so on and so forth? And the scripture will say, no, 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 same essence. Mm. So they are absolutely identical in every conceivable way. Yet there is a you and an I. There is a conversation between them, yeah. uh, between the three of them, but they're identical. So how then do you try and rationalize that? Mm. 
you especially have to, from our perspective because we've exactly. only seen one soul one person yes so at the end of the day you just have to come to a place where you just claim antinomy i don't know i yeah. it's a min, it's a mystery that i embrace by faith yeah. understanding that i cannot un, fully comprehend this this mm. god mm. his way above mm. my comprehension so this this past November, the three of us and some other people, we went to the Evangelical Theological Society, and it was the, the, one of the main topics was the the Trinity. And uh, at at that conference, I heard a guy named Fred Sanders, who gave a, a lecture, a plenary session. And uh, Fred is is one of the leading voices on understanding the Trinity and, and his writing about it. So if you want to hear more or read more about the Trinity. Uh, Fred Sanders is a great author to pursue. Uh, he mm -hmm. has a book called The Deep Things of God, How the Trinity Changes Everything. It's available on Amazon for like $15 or Kindle for less. Uh, that That's a good resource for you to go to. Also, if you aren't uh, the book reading type, you want a satirical short video. Something we show our interns every year is called St. Patrick's Bad Analogies, and it's by these these Lutheran guys who make satirical videos. That's a little bit more on the edge. And it's hilarious. But it's well worth your time. Uh, and basically, what is it called again? It's called uh, St. Patrick's Bad Analogies. It's on YouTube. Just, on YouTube. just search uh, Lutheran Satire Trinity. It'll come up. And uh, the great thing about that video is it shows all the ways that people have tried to, to, to you know, talk about the Trinity in a way to make it more accessible, to remove the mystery, and how every attempt is a is a heretical move from church history. And so it's a great little uh, three, four minute video if you want to watch that. Uh, great question. Thanks so much for saying that in. Uh, you guys okay doing one more? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, this question comes from Matthew chapter seven, verses 22 and 23. It says this, how is it that God will allow people to perform miracles in his name, yet they aren't saved on judgment day? Does this also imply a sensationalism where, where healings and miracles are performed by Jesus and the disciples only? And today, uh, the charismatic folks fall under Matthew 7, 22 and 23. So there's two kinds of questions. How is it that people can do healings in Jesus name and yet they aren't saved? And are these kinds of healings the kinds of things that we should be expecting to, ha to happen through genuine believers or do all miracles that happen now fall under that Matthew 7, 22, 23 grid. So does anyone have that passage they can read for us? Or I can pull it up real quick too. Greg, why don't you pull it up and I'll... Okay, I'll read it. it. So Matthew 7, 20, I'm going to start 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons... And in your name, perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, I would start, I would start by saying, okay, these people are performing this miracle, these miracles in the context of a church. Mm. So in a church context. So um, it is not the people or the pastors or the leaders who are performing the miracles. It's not them. Okay. They come to God and they uh, request that the Lord would heal. And the Lord himself chooses mm. to use these people as vessels or instruments for his service, to, to, to accomplish his purposes. Now, note what I said there. God chose to use these individuals as instruments to accomplish his purposes. That being the case, you, will, you can look at the scriptures all across the Old Testament and even into the New, where God will use human beings, even people who are wicked and, ev and, and evil, to accomplish his purposes and his plans. A classic example can be found in Isaiah 45, where you find God speaking to Cyrus the king, who was a pagan, mm. who did not even acknowledge Yahweh, and yet God says Cyrus was his anointed. And God chose to bless him and God chose to give him riches and power and, and ability and, and all the nations would melt before him. And he opened doors and gave him uh, hidden treasures and all that 
for a specific purpose. What was the purpose? That, that God would use Cyrus to, to release the nation of Israel from their, from their cap- Babylonian captivity. Mm. So at the end of the day, God used a pagan king to accomplish his purposes. And God blessed that pagan king, even though that king did not acknowledge him. My point here being, the, a non-Christian, God could use mm. a non-Christian to accomplish his purposes, either lay your hand and pray for someone and the person gets healed. Did the non-Christian heal the person? No. Mm. Who who was behind that healing? Mm. God was. I think about Pharaoh. When Moses comes to Pharaoh, right? And you see this magic show, yes. you know, showdown. Yes. You know, here's your snake, here's my snake. Yes. You know, and, yet, and, it has, and it raises the question, well, did Pharaoh have the power, or did his sorcerers have the power to, you know, you know, make a stick come into a stake, no. snake? No. No. And ultimately, again, in, in that story, every single, um, mm. every single plague was an attack to the God of Egypt, mm-hmm. an attack to the God of Egypt. And all God was doing, he was setting Pharaoh up so that he could utterly destroy him that the nations around will know who God is. So many times God does this. He uses vessels, even unworthy vessels, to accomplish his purposes. So the fact that God can do ministry through a person Mm -hmm. does not necessarily prove that that person is in right relationship with God. No, no. And I will say this. uh, How many many, um, people in ministry, pastors, uh, evangelists, or whatever, who have had tremendous success, success meaning... Lots of fruit. A lot of fruit. People coming to saving faith and all these things. And then at some point, they fall from grace. Either they had affairs or they stole money or they they lied or fraudulent. And yet, thousands of people came to saving faith through their ministry. So is the ministry... At the end of the day, mm. we, we get all bent out of shape because we think, oh, this ministry is so successful because Andy is awesome or mm. Ezra is awesome. No, mm. it's not Andy and it's not Ezra either. It mm. is God mm. who is saving people. But for some reason, we human beings often tend to assume mm. that, oh, because the church is so big, Greg must be awesome. Mm. It has nothing to do with Greg. Mm. Nothing. Because you may have a pastor down the street who has 30 or 40 people who's way more faithful mm. and way more godly than Greg is. Mm. But the Lord just chose, in for whatever reason, chose to accomplish his purposes through Greg. I, th- I think too, it's important to note like the thrust of what's being ma- made here, along with what you're saying, Ezzy, is that we're looking at the idea of true and false prophets, right? True and po- true and false disciples, those people who actually have a relationship with God, who actually love Him and are doing ministry to build His kingdom, and and those who who do not. Mm-hmm. And, and so I think oftentimes we'll get so caught up, as you're saying, Ezra, with all this out, you know, outward stuff mm-hmm. that, that, that sucks us in and we think, oh, that's success and that's good. And, and God's going, no, 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 you, I still judge the heart. Mm-hmm. You know, and and th- this is what the key of this is, is does this person actually have a relationship with me? And Jesus is saying, or what, what's being said here, mm-hmm. um, is, this is Christ speaking here, is saying that there are some people that may do some amazing things, but their heart is not for me. It doesn't mean that they're in. And I think what you bring up is awesome because how many times, so Andy, let's say you brought your sick grandma who had cancer and whatever, and you brought her to church and I laid my hands on her and I prayed over her and she was healed 100%. And maybe she was in crutches. Now she's walking out and it's great. Everybody will think, oh, Ezra is a man of God, man of God, Ezra, man of God. And then come judgment day, because that text that Greg just read, yeah, that's judgment day. What Christ will do when he comes back to make all things new. And Jesus will now divide the sheep and the goats. So the sheep, yeah, they'll enter into his eternal rest. The goats will have people who are doing uh, miraculous signs and wonders. Mm -hmm. And then they will come to the Lord and say, Lord, Lord. Notice what Jesus says they'll call him. They'll call him Lord. Lord, Lord, did we not do these things in your name? Meaning we were in ministry, dude. Mm. We were doing all these great things. That, That said, 
not everyone who stands up as a proclaimer of Jesus Christ and you think, oh, he's a man of God. Yeah, not everyone is a man of God. Because according to Jesus, Mm -hmm. uh, there'll be many who will be so-called men and women of God who will not make it. This Mm. reminds me of the Apostle Paul. He says something very similar in 1 Corinthians. First in chapter 12, he talks about people who are gifted in amazing ways in the church. church. Mm -hmm. And then he goes into chapter 13, and Mm -hmm. and what does he get at? He says, listen, you might be able to do all these amazing things, but if you don't love God... Right, it, it gets back to his heart. Then you're just making noise. It's all noisy me- gong. Yeah, it's just meaningless. Mm. You right. could even die a martyr's death. He says yeah. that's that's the most striking line to me in that mm-hmm. passage. The fact you could die a martyr's death. Yes, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Yeah, worthless. Yeah, it was all futile, fruitless. I, I, at the end of the your day, your heart isn't. Yeah, for me, it, I, do you do this because you want to look great and you want to go down in history, or because you love Jesus? Mm. Yes, I think f- for me as a as a preacher and as a pastor, that passage mm. terrifies me mm. because every time I, I check my heart, I check my heart, and I wonder, okay, do I do I really love the Lord Jesus? Or do I just love the fact that people come and pat me on the back and say, hey, Pastor Ezra, and they say nice things about me and I'll feel good and, you know, mm. because it, it, it's evident not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom. Not everyone who, who calls me Lord, Lord. And I ask, am I, am I one of them? Mm. Will I, will I persevere to the end? And I look at my heart and I ask, do I love the right things mm. or not? And my loves mm will determine or will actually show, reveal where my allegiance is, the loves of my heart. Mm. Mm-hmm. So one, one last piece of that question that we didn't quite get to yet was, mm. was the idea of if it's true that some people who God uses to do miraculous things aren't saved, does that mean that we now have to take a, a skeptical view of people in different, say, charismatic movements that that pursue healing and these kinds of miraculous things in more fervor than other traditions? Like, is it, does that eat, is that a, a, an equation we have to make now that, that we have to adopt a skepticism about the true faith of those who, who have healings and miracles come out of their ministry? Well, first off thing that I would just jump in and say is, is we're, it's not, it's not our job to be judging people. And they're and judging people's hearts in particular. What what are we? What we are supposed to judge though, is the doctrine of the gospel that's being preached. Mm-hmm. And th- this is where I think a lot of people think or get caught up with the good news or the gospel is healing. The good news isn't healing. You know, it, it's not somebody putting their hand on your forehead and pushing you back to the ground and all of a sudden that sciatic nerve isn't bothering you anymore. Mm-hmm. That's not the good news of the gospel. The good news, Paul explains, no, 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 I've given you the good news of the gospel that death has been defeated, evil's been defeated in Jesus Christ Amen. on the cross and that you can be set free mm-hmm. and now you are adopted into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. And so now our sights aren't on this life, mm-hmm. but the life to come. Yes. And, and I think that's where people get really caught up. So what, the question that I want to ask myself is, is, is this church preaching the gospel? Yes. And, and that to me is the, is the key. I would add on to that. Are you majoring on the minors? Mm. So because in the biblical text, what we see is signs, wonders, miracles adorn the gospel, not the other way around. So unfortunately in some, not all, but in some charismatic settings, it seems like it's all about the healing. It's all about the miracle, but it's not about the gospel. But in the early church, the signs and wonders pointed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I think that's where the focus is. Like, I I agree 100% with you, Andy. It's all about the gospel of Jesus Christ and whether it's being preached there. Secondly, what I would say is... Um, there may be some who are listening, and you may not necessarily be charismatic, um, you might be more conservative in your approach to to faith and and the spirit of God and things like that. I will say this: one thing that I really admire, I tremendously admire about our charismatic brothers and sisters is they pursue God fervently, mm-hmm. and they they believe that God has the power to do what He says He would do. 
and they and they go for it and they ask big and they wait on Christ and I think there's something to be admired about that absolutely um, they really believe God now there are some ways in which their pursuit of that mm. I may question some of their ways and some of the outreach strategies they may have which may not necessarily be biblical but at the same time do they believe God yes does God heal absolutely would, can God raise someone from the dead? You bet he can. Can he make someone who had cancer, the cancer to go? Yes. Why doesn't he do that today? Maybe it's because we don't pray mm. more. Or we don't pray fervently as we ought to. Uh, but our charismatic brothers and sisters, man, they pray. There's no question there. And they see God and they believe that he can heal. Mm. And I think if we if we believe to the same level, maybe... Uh, maybe we might be able to see God doing some of these things in our own lives. Mm. But for the most, f- for me, uh, sometimes I wonder, is he gonna, really? Mm. Mm. All right, well, let's end it there. And uh, we will pick up the conversation next week. If you have questions you want us to answer, you can email extra at northview.org. Thank you so much, Andy and Ezra, for your contributions. And we will... Good to be in your presence, Greg. It's always good to be in your presence, Andy. And oh, we wow. will... <laughs> you too, Ezra. It keeps sounding in my mind. It's... Uh... <laughs> it's... All right. That was awkward. That was awkward. Well, that's a good way to end. <laughs> See you at church on the weekend.